Okay, uh, we want to say we're very blessed this morning to be able to come uh, to you while you're at home. And for those of you that are here at the church building, we want to say that uh, we're, we just appreciate God for everything that he's doing and how he's moving in a great way for each and every one of us here. I believe this is a great time that we are in to just uh, worship God and to just let God have his way inside of each and every one of us. I believe that he's moving mightily and he's, he is a God that's raising up overcomers. He's raising up people and I believe some, some of the things that we have talked about, you know, or, or I've talked about and ministered about in the early stages of my ministry, now I'm beginning to realize the more that I get acquainted and the more that the word of God begins to come alive inside of me, some of the uh, uh, issues that God, uh, I believe, is going to be using in the time that we are in, I believe we're just now starting to see spiritual tools or spiritual issues that's going to be manifested. But in order for them to be manifested, we have to get an understanding. It has to come through this uh, mind. Of, it has to be revealed by the Spirit of God. And God has to do a work inside of each and every one of us here. Now, I'm going to do a little bit of teaching here. And I'm going to start from uh, the book of Exodus uh, 13th chapter 12 and 13 is what I want to read. They see if we are able to go there, it would be good if we could put it on here. That way we can uh, let the word of God begin to soak inside of each and every one of us here. In, uh, we're going to be in Louisiana, or I'm going to be in Louisiana next Sunday morning. Uh, River, what is the name of that church, LaVon? River Riders Covenant Church with Kathy and um, Walter. We will be there with them. In the, uh, there's a great door opening down there, uh, just right there north of the state of Louisiana. Uh, we're going to be able to establish the word of God there. And just whatever God wants to do, we're, we're going to be open unto the people that's coming in. So I give God all the praise and the thanks for what he's doing. Now I want to just uh, kind of touch on a few things here this morning because I believe unless the Spirit of God launches me and you out of this level or out of the mentality that we have here as a church, we that are serving God and we that attend church, there's a lot of people, you know, that has this revelation and some are not attending church and some are not really, you know, uh, ha have a fellowship only in just certain people. You know, sometimes they meet up and they, uh, and that's okay too because I believe that, that God has a way of developing people in this day and time here in I believe we must deal with the firstborn and we have to look at that I believe that there, that me and you here today, the firstborn is going to represent, you know, when me and you, when our mama and daddy or who, uh, whatever took place and me and you came, you know, me and you came to exist on this earth and we begin to grow up, I believe that's the first nature the firstborn, we, we, we begin to now be alive in this day and time here and now. That's, that's what we want to uh, talk about here just a little bit because he or she will always come first, but the second is going to be the spiritual one that's going to be birthed in here. Now here in the, uh, what is it, the 12th verse, it's going to tell us you are to give over to the Lord the first offspring of every womb. All the firstborn males of your livestock belongs to God. Redeem with a lamb ever firstborn donkey. But if you do not redeem it, break its neck. 
redeem every firstborn among your sons. Now, this is what we're looking at here today, and we can understand that Jesus Christ, the firstborn of the many brethren, has already, uh, you know, he's already died, and his sacrifice has taken place and everything, but we're looking at it symbolically here, what Israel was supposed to do back in the day, or uh, I believe we're still, when we deal with, what is it, the book of Exodus? I don't know if we're still dealing with, uh, I think we're dealing with the uh, Jewish people here now because uh, the Jewish people did not come to existence uh, until after, uh, after the, uh, you know, when they came out of Egypt and everything else. And then uh, when Jacob's name was all, you know, it was all turned around and then the 12 tribes began to come to existence and then that's when the Jewish but meanwhile in the book of Genesis I believe God had the Hebrew that was what that there was the race of people that was on this earth that's how come we must understand he uh, uh, when we deal with the Hebrew we're dealing with uh, people that knows how to cross over they know how to, in other words they don't stay in one level or they don't stay in one uh, they don't it, just stay in one town but they go from one town to another town okay that's the easiest way i know how to break this down here right now in israel did not become in israel until jacob's name begins to be changed at that time and not everybody that claims to be in Israel is really a, 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 an Israelite. We've got to understand that. And not everybody that claims to be a Cherokee is in a Cherokee either. Sometimes we have to understand the terminology. Everybody just, uh, as Jay Swaller used to be, the wannabes. They just want to be, they, they, want, they want to fit in. It's better if you just say, I have a heart for the Cherokees. You'd be in a whole lot better off there. So the key thing in this day and time is going to be, are we willing to cross over? Are we willing to go beyond than what, God, uh, beyond than what our minds can think of or beyond this old carnality realm that we are in here now? Now, I believe that, that this law would only apply to donkeys, but in verse 13 above, God applies it to all the firstborn of Israel. God says first that all the firstborn of the donkeys had to be redeemed with a lamb. And hence, all the firstborn of Israel had to be redeemed in he was in effect calling them a herd of donkeys. So understand that. That's how come whenever we deal with donkeys and we deal with livestock, a lot of times uh, when we look at a donkey inside of me and you are ways of how we live and how we think is going to simply be, uh, you know, Sonny can probably explain this better than any one of us or maybe somebody else can, but whenever you have a donkey, you, you are continuously, you are telling that donkey, come on now, move, move. Come on now. Sometimes you have to get a list, but you have to just continually. In, in other words, I wish that you were somebody that would just get it and you it would just soak in inside of you. But them long ears, Sonny, sometimes they probably just irritate at you because you have to sometimes get a big get a club and say, I'll club you now. You better get on out, get on down out of my way. But that's how a donkey is symbolically. And we have to understand now. Look at this. I'm, I'm going to point you in a way here today that all of this is leading to the Feast of Pentecost. Pentecost represents donkeys here today. But that mentality sometimes is inside of me and you here today because what, what all, the same way that, you know, when, when Sonny has had a donkey at one time in his life, you know how he used to speak to that donkey? Sonny will probably never tell anybody what he told that donkey. Just between him and the, him and the donkey knows what took place. But what happens is God is the same way with me. That's how God is with me and you. In other words, God is saying, Now, uh, Sammy, are you going to let me speak to you today? 
Dale, LaVon, are you guys going to let me speak to you all today? Come on, I wish you would just listen. See, God is the same way with me and you here today. But the key thing is, Dale, sometimes this old mind of ours, and Sammy, sometimes what happens is we got other things we need to do right now. Delbert, sometimes we say, well, I got so much that I've got to do. I can't, I can't, I, you know, I want to hear from God and I'm waiting to hear from God. No, 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 no. If God, if, no, in other words, if you really give God a chance, you can hear from him. You really can. If you, if we could just only learn, just let there be a little silence in heaven, just for a little while. Let there be silence in heaven. Then let that revelation begin to be revealed inside of you. Yes. See, sometimes we think on that Bible verse, we got to go to heaven. When, when we get to heaven, then there's going to be a little silence. Then, whoo, everything's just going to explode. Now, no, 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 right now. Let there be just a little, little bit of silence here right now. And then in this heavenly mind, Jesus living inside of each and every one of us, then let it just begin to explode. Let it just begin to do what it wants to do inside of each and every one of us here. That's how come they say, be quiet, quiet. <laughs> let, me, let me talk to you for just a little while. But sometimes people don't know how to just pay attention and be quiet. That's like a jackass if I can use that terminology without offending we're all adults and we're all supposed to be mature okay so if so if somebody calls me and jack I know one time I did some of this teaching in Eureka Springs I believe we no Brentson and this old Indian guy from way up north got he was his turn and he said I don't know what to say I just got I just got you being called a jackass well <laughs> so uh so so don't in other words, don't take this in the wrong way. This all has to do with spiritually and coming out of a place that we have been for a long time. And sometimes when we're not mature or not ready to listen, sometimes we take words in a different way here. And then we go a different way with it. We run with it. And we never, you know, step into what God has got for each and every one of us here. Now, I believe that, that they were all in need of redemption. And the donkey had to be redeemed along with the lamb, the, the male lamb. And we have to understand in this day and time that God is doing the same thing with the lamb being inside of each and every one of us here. See, that was why God instituted Passover. It was necessary to redeem the people with a lamb because they could not be presented to God unclean. Because of Passover, Israel became the sheep of his pastor. Yes. And you find that in Psalms 100 and verse 3. Just write that down. Without such redemption, they would have remained the donkeys of his corral. See, they would have remained donkeys in his corral. And I don't want, as a leader here today, I don't want to leave you in a corral being a donkey. And me being a donkey, but I want us to be redeemed along with the blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary here today. I want us to launch out more than just being a jackass and somebody having to always say, come on now, this is what you got to do. I thought I told you you need to do this. We're back, we're back and we're talking about the same old thing again. We're praying about the same thing we prayed about two, three years ago. You said you wanted going to do that no more you're still doing it see we have to understand how a donkey operates i remember years ago uh, there was uh, elderly women there was a woman named gotha that went to church here you just had to know gotha and uh she got kind of physically mentally to where she was unstable so we had to go in and you know, clean her house, and she had she loved cats, and and uh, one day uh, this other sister went in there, and I mean, you talking about cleaning house? She went in there and cleaned house, 
And when she left her trailer house, the, the trailer house from inside was clean. You just had to know this woman. She a retired uh, policeman out of uh, Washington, D.C., and you just had to know. She stands kind of tall, and, and uh, this woman, uh, when she does something, she does it, she does it right, and, and, and she'll let you know, you know, if there's something that you're lacking or something you're not doing right. She, being on that police force kind of brainwashed a little bit, I guess. But, but anyway, she got things done. And what happened one day was she went in there and cleaned everything up, and God promised her, I will not let that cat back in there. It'll stay outside because it's, it's a cat that it ain't even mine. It's just a cat that wants to come over here and it knows that I will let that cat inside here. And, uh, you know, she had some problems physically with her body and everything. And I remember I went, me and her, uh, me and her was talking and she said, the, the uh, retired police DC, me and her was talking, Clifton, let me show you. Let me show you what I did. Man, her trailer house looks good. Let's go over there. Boy, we knocked on that door. You don't have policemen knocks. Here she comes. Got her standing there looking up. And you going to let us in or not? What'd you do? And she kind of peeped in. You told me you'd not let that cat back in by me. And her trailer was a mess. She's stinking and everything. And God just said, well, well, have mercy on me. But, 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 the, but, but, the, key, but the key thing is, you know, if we keep, keep doing things over and over after even when somebody tries to help us, there's something wrong. You understand what I'm saying? That's why, it's, it, that, that's why the enemy power is going to target our minds and as he targets our minds what the enemy power wants to do within the enemy that's inside of us you understand what i'm saying we are our worst enemy if we come up with a a mind i mean we'll let that mentality it, it'll just run uh, it'll torment our minds all day long all sometimes we go for weeks and everything else but the key thing is going to be that God is moving in. There's a remnant that's going to know how to do spiritual warfare in this day and time. So that's the time that we are in. I really do believe that. Now Hosea, Hosea 11 chapter in verse 1, he says, When Israel was a youth, I loved him, and out of Egypt... I called my son. See, Israel was in effect fathered by God, but their mother was Egypt. So even after they left Egypt, they longed for the food that they enjoyed. They did not seem to appreciate. That's why we find in Numbers 11, verse 4 and 6, See, what we have to understand, a donkey always wants to eat what, you know, it learns how to eat from the beginning. It always wants to have its own way. That's how come we look at uh, stubbornness or we look at a donkey and we say it's got big ears, but it doesn't want to listen. If somebody had that long of the ears, it should not have a hard time hearing what somebody is saying unto them. And the key thing is God has given each and every one of us a big ear, a spiritual ear, where that when he speaks, we hear very plainly. We hear what thus saith the Lord God. We know what God wants out of us, and we know what needs to take place here and now. So 11, the numbers, 11 and 4. So in the rabble who was among them, they had greedy desires. And also the sons of Israel wept. See, they wept again and said. Now here, here they go. They're going to start crying now. They're, they're, they're going to put on a big show here now. Who said, <coughs> who will give us meat to eat 
Now, can you just imagine what somebody is, what, what they're doing here? This Israel being a son of God, God leading them out of Egypt, leading them to the promised land. But all of a sudden, some of, some of them begins to start weeping. I guess the word weeping would be like we say, like a little baby is crying. Is, am I correct here? Or they're, they're starting to, but here right out of nowhere, they're going to start crying. It's like you take a bottle away from a baby, it wants it back, it starts crying. So what happens is they start saying, who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we used to eat free in Egypt, and all the cucumbers, and the melons, and the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic. But now our appetite is gone. There's nothing at all to look at except this manna. There ain't nothing else that we can look at. Only thing that's available here and now is the portion that now God has given unto them. But that old mentality says, I know what I can do, and I know what I can eat, I know what I can drink, I know how to get food, I know how to do this and that, I know how to live my own lifestyle. For me and you, we can say, well, I know what I need, and I'm going to Walmart and get it. And, and we can say, you know, it's easier for me and you to get away instead of just looking at, see, God is barely got enough for them just to stay hungry. But I would rather stay hungry for the Word of God than just eating anything that I want to eat than what this old jackass wants to have, okay? What this old donkey mentality wants. And I believe in a time that we are in that we're going to see people breaking away and they're going to eat what the Lord has prepared for them. Now, and also in Hosea 11 and 1, they were... In other words, tells us that they were in Ishmael, not in Isaac. So at that stage of character development and spiritual experience for this season, they needed to be redeemed by a lamb at Passover. When God brings them out of Egypt, what Abraham did with Hagar, God did with Egypt. Now, Abraham took Hagar and brought forth Ishmael. Am I pronouncing that word? Ishmael. God took Egypt and brought forth Israel. Now, these are all prophetic patterns that tells us about the divine principles that God has. In, in many of what we call Americans on a Sunday morning, they're struggling the same way that everybody else is. They're going through some things in their lives. They're, they're wondering what needs to take place and what needs to happen. Not only in how we relate to God and experience him through the feast, but also in matters of timing. So in the manifestations of the sons of God, the overcomers in training will move from a Pentecostal level to the tabernacle level in their knowledge of God. See, we have to understand that. Now, these were some of the teachings that I did when we were doing the SWAT uh, training there at Two Rivers Native American uh, senator in by Tulsa at Nigel's and, and for some reasons a lot of this revelation it got a hold of brother Lonnie from Illinois then LaVon you probably remember these messages here too it got a hold of LaVon and a lot of us and it got a hold of, it, it began to institutionalize you know my mind in, 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 in a way that I thought you know that man we've got to change I've got to change and if I'm going to change and that means that whatever I minister whatever I give unto the people surely they will begin to see what God is doing what God is saying in this day and time so 
This is a time that we are in that I believe God is going to revisit, restructure, rebirth what he really wants to do in a people. He wants to move in a greater way and he wants us to just oversee what he really has in store for each and every one of us. He wants you to know what to look forward to. He wants you to know what is up the road, okay? What is really there waiting for me and you. And it's not just being a donkey. But I believe that, you remember uh, in that one uh, Bible verse that Jesus told one of his disciples, I want you to go to a certain place. When you get there, you're going to find a donkey that has never been ridden. No one has ever ridden. or never, Nobody has really trained that donkey. But I want you to just get that donkey. He's wild as he can be. And I want you to bring him to me. See, that's what we're doing. We have to understand that. We're bringing him. We want to bring you to Jesus. And you know what Jesus did with that donkey? What he did was he got on that donkey, did he not? And he rode that donkey. Come on, where did he ride it to what was the next step? He was getting ready to be crucified, wasn't he? But a donkey has to be redeemed along with the lamb in order for me and you to see this redemption really to begin to take place. And when Jesus died on that cross, the donkey, he rode on that donkey. And next thing you know, they were in the upper room. And then next thing you know, that's where the, uh, later on the crucifixion began to take place. But Pentecost, if me and you can hear the voice of God and understand the revelation, the wild jackass that is inside of each and every one of us is getting ready to be tamed. And as it begins to be tamed, what's going to happen is the mind is going to be restructured spiritually. It's no longer going to think the way that it did, but it's going to have a mind of Christ. And what's going to happen is it's going to say that, Father, I know that there is another level that you're wanting to bring me into. And in order for me to really graduate from being a wild jackass or from the Feast of Pentecost, I got to quit relying upon the goosebumps. I got to quit relying upon depending and relying upon a dance or upon uh, hollering, shouting. You know, shouting is okay. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. But I believe I'll shout because there's victory. I will shout because I know I'm an overcomer here today. But what happens is that mind begins to carry on. It says, now I must go on into the next level. But our Am I mature enough to go there? Am I able to hear all of this revelation without me getting confused? Am I going to be able to understand the uh, seventh heaven or the third heaven? Am I going to be able to understand that there is a feast of tabernacle? Then there's a feast of trumpets. Am I going to be able to see a seventh day? And, and I mean, am I able, going to be able to see the eighth day? Am I going to be able to see God where... That one day in the book of Revelation that where that there is a lake afar, that someday that I will be able to have that I got to love riding on that white horse. Come on, right, right behind the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And in that love that is so burning inside of me will be the far that's burning that I, I've got such an agape love inside of me that I'm going after the false prophets. I'm going after Babylon. And I'm not going after it, but I'm to, I'm to be the one. That what is inside of my, my mind, which is such a love, is going to be so, so burning for this whole creation that it's going to be thrown into the, that I, in other words, the mind and the love that I have represents the lake afar here today. See, we have to be able to understand this terminology. We have to be able to understand that if we're going to go there and be what God wants us to be in this day and time we have to really be able to get that Ishmael yes. we have to get that wild jackass out of the way yeah. Yeah. now 
But as Paul speaks of this too in the redemption of our body, which is in Romans 8 and 23, they say we can go there. See, why would the body need to be redeemed? It must be redeemed because it is currently in an unclean donkey. There ain't too many people will, you know, religion can't take this. They can't be called a donkey and sat there. They'll, they'll buck up like a donkey and won't even realize it. They will. They'll squeal, they'll holler, buck up, and kick around and everything else, and they won't even realize that they're as religious as they can be. They'll make a big show and won't know. They won't even know what they really are. But praise God, we're coming to a brand new day. What is this? 8 and 23? Not only so, but we ourselves. See, we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. See, that's what we're waiting on. And as long as Christ is inside of us, that same baptism, that same crucifixion, this carnality, this first Adam is being crucified. This wild donkey is being crucified right along with the donkey right now. That's what's happening. Now, in Genesis 16 and 12, yeah, in 16, Genesis 16 and 12, this is what the angel says. And he will be a wild donkey of a man his hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand will be against him and he will live to the east of his brothers. So it's talking about somebody, isn't it? It's talking about a race. It's talking about a man that will come to pass. So Ishmael's father was Abraham and later called Abraham. Abraham. Well, Ishmael's father was Abram, later called Abraham. Ishmael's mother was Hagar, and the Egyptian's bondwoman. She was one of the Pharaoh's daughter by a concubine. Pharaoh gave her to Sarah as a restitution payment after that he had taken her into his, not knowing that she was Abram's wife. You find this in Genesis 12, 10 through 20. So, so it, whenever we begin to start looking at all of this, I believe what we're going to find is that, there, that, how, that Abram, when, she began, when, when Abram and Hagar, in other words, in 16, that Hagar's attitude changed after she conceived Abram's child. Now watch this. We, bec we become a child unto our heavenly father in the Pentecostal age. We find that out. Okay? And sometimes Ishmael's mother, Hagar, she sometimes, we get acquainted with Hagar, which we say that she is not the promised woman, the promised seed. Now let's really analyze this here today and let's really look at this very close. Now does that mean that God allowed Abram and Hagar to have a son by the name of Ishmael? God allowed that God permitted that, and now he's going to use what happened there to point us into a direction that we are either going to be caught in a trap of staying to be a Hagar's child, son, or are we going to graduate and mature and become the real mother that was promised the seed, which is Sarah? And the only way that we can find the real true seed of Sarah is going to be we got to graduate and let Hagar go 
in, we have to graduate and go on into the Feast of the Tabernacle. See, a lot, of, a lot of times what people say is, I'm not Hagar's child, I'm not his son. But we got to understand this. Now, God is a God that has love, which is very unlimited. Does that mean that he hated Hagar? Did God hate Hagar? Who really knows that story? When Hagar... God got in the wilderness. Who spoke to her? God did. What did God tell her? See, a lot of times we, we don't want to, we don't want to, you, you know, we don't want to talk about Hagar because we think that, uh, no, we have to understand both the Hagar woman spiritually in the Hagar, in the Sarah spirit, dwells inside of a man and a woman. They're both, they're working on us. And we, we are either going to make one or the other our permanent mother. You understand that? But God, no matter how you look at him, still loves us regardless of which one we, we choose to spend our whole life with here on this earth. So, so does that really open up a brand new avenue here? Because we have to understand that religious people are going to tell us, well, Hagar is somebody that's of the devil. No, Hagar, if, if Hagar is the devil, then he lives inside of us. Because for some people, I, I know I was, Hagar was my mom, Spiritually, for I don't know how many years until I really got birthed in unto the feast of the tabernacle. And God didn't, God didn't chew me out and God make it rough on me. He just continued to love me for who I was. See, sometimes we look at things, yeah, we look at things and we say, well, old sister marriage, that, uh, she's a child of Hagar, I feel sorry for her. Or that church down the road, come on, that big old church. I'm talking about the biggest church we got down the road. It, their, their mom is Hagar. I feel sorry for them. No, we're looking at this wrong. God loves everybody. And God has a plan for everybody. He, he really does. I just want to be caught somewhere, not right here, but I want, I want to be caught somewhere where there's, I'm in the midst of a people that's sharing about the promised seed now, about Sarah, the promised seed. Now, <laughs> let me show a guy. She's going to laugh about that all week long. <laughs> So when Hagar conceived, she apparently began to despise Sarah. You find that in six, uh, Genesis 16 in verse 4. She began to desire a calling that was not hers. Now can you see a calling in the Pentecostal level that many, many of our people are in, even our famous popular evangelists that will telecast how So we are in a time where we, 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 some of you are going to be able to see things from an eagle's view or from a heavenly view. And when you begin to start seeing things in that order, I believe that's where at the same time, I believe that God is going to allow you to be silent and then a time for you to speak. And then it's going to be a time that he's going to mature you to where that you will be able to understand now the shifting that God is going to be doing inside of your heart. Because this is I, I, with a Pentecostal age, a wild jackass. I mean, they have really told one another off, haven't they? 
They have ruined, kicked one another, and they've, and it's almost like they're hurting even unto this day. They're still separated. That's why we got so many church buildings that's built in this day and time. It's because of Ishmael, and it's because they've chosen to be a, a they, they want Hagar to be their mom, but God is saying, I can deliver you, and I can set you free, and I can, and I, the promise that I have made with the overcomers is still there. It's not over with. I can still uh, shift and I can still redeem. Come on, somebody, along with my son, Jesus Christ. So that's the time that we are in here. Now, I believe that Sarah, pun now Sarah punished her in some manner. It's not spec specified in Genesis 16 and 6. And Hagar, see, she ran away from home in the wilderness, but an angel appeared. An angel of God appeared to Hagar that in what told her to return. Now, here we are. Here we are. I know who you are. I know whose mama you are. So whose mama are you here today? He knows exactly where you at. Yeah. But he spoke to her and said, return. Yeah. Go home. God did not, just because Sarah made it rough on her and she takes off and leaves home, God intervenes. Yes. Return. Go on back home. And as long as God speaks, that's all that matters. Right. So now she's turning, she's going back home. So the angel also told her that she would have a son and that she would call his name Ishmael, which means, now watch this, which means God hears. God hears. He's given us ears so that we can hear in this Pentecostal level, what he's saying unto each and every one of us. Amen. <clears throat> so in this context, the angel tells Hagar that her son will be a wild donkey man. So the Hebrew, now watch this, we've got to understand how to really teach this and present it unto somebody else when they say, well, where, how do I know you're telling the truth and how can uh, I know that you're really coming to me in a way that what I'm hearing is the truth? See, a lot of people ain't going to be able to hear in the spirit, so they're going to ask you these questions. And that's okay. Sometimes when uh, they're going to ask you these questions in a very polite way so that they can have that revelation and they can walk with God. But there's some that's going to ask you this question to challenge you. That's why you must know how to deal with the people in this day and time. So how do we define that Ishmael is a jackass? And how do we define Pentecostal is a jackass? And what little that I have downloaded unto you up to now can that be enough foundation for you to really explain to somebody else to where that you can just download it now to somebody? And then that, see that, that's what we got to look for as, as a teacher and as a leader. You know, I have to make sure that today that what I download unto you is not going to be just something I'm going to give you and just leave you hanging. I want to make sure that you really understand. And most of all, the Spirit of God continues to work through you. Yes. That's going to be the key thing here. Now, the Hebrew term is para, Adam. Hagar, her son, shall be called a wild donkey man. Now, the wild donkey man, the Hebrew term is para, P-A-R-E-H, in Adam. So the word para is translated wild donkey. You got that? That's how you 
go back to the origin of where we get this wild donkey. So how can you tell somebody now that Pentecostal is a wild donkey or a wild jackass? Do you know now? Hmm. The word pero is translated wild donkey. So, so just begin to look at what the Spirit of God is telling each and every one of us. So in the story of Ishmael, we see him as, as a type of Pentecostal in relation to Isaac, who is a type of the Feast of Tabernacle. See, they, they blend in together. It's like I was asking that day, said this morning, when you graft, Yeah, when you graft into a, what kind of tree was that, Daisy? Crab tree. When you graft into a crab tree, what begins to happen to the stalk of that tree? What really happens? That means you're grafting, you're putting something else into it Daisy, do you still have that definition you shared with me? The one you said it changes or something? What else? Less diseased and it makes it stronger. So I believe that even the sap and the leaves Everything begins to change on that tree when you graft it in. And when me and you begins to get engrafted in as an overcomer in Christ Jesus, then that means me and you are becoming just like Christ Jesus. So everything inside of us begins to get stronger and it's undise undiseased. And it also is a type of where we get stronger and then next thing you know, there's a different outlook. What changes from the out inside, sometimes what it does in the outside appearance, that even changes. So that's what Christ is doing right now inside of each and every one of us here. Now, let me say, I know we've already said this. Donkeys have big ears. They were designed for hearing. Ishmael's name, God hears. Now look that up, Ishmael. Really look it up and see what it really says. Shows the purpose of Pentecost, which is to hear the voice of God, as we have seen by example at Mount Sinai. Ishmael in Hagar were also associated with Mount Sinai in Galatians chapter 4 in verse 25. Ishmael is born first, but he is not the one who will bring forth the promise. See, we have to realize in a time that we are in, how long, some of us, we've been going to church a long time. I think I'm going on into the 40th year now, pretty close. If I came into this in 1980, I got to be hitting 40 years pretty close. And it's almost like one whole, one whole generation here. And I've got to understand that the qualities of how to really bring and birth in the fullness of what Christ has really got for me I, it's almost like I'm not close to it. But I know it's there. I know it's inside. I have the will. I have the revelation. I have the knowledge. Things that God has revealed to me are real. They're genuine. And the only way that I can, I can see the fullness of who God is and for me to really let that, uh, for me to really experience and to have that manifestation of who God really is inside of me, I've got to understand these, the Pentecostal age, these big old ears are going to have to profit me something. 
In other words, the key thing is going to be, I'm going to have to hear. Hearing is so genuine in this day and time. It's so mandatory for me and you as, come on, as being a part of the overcomers. Hearing is so, it, it's a matter of life in death here today. That's how, that's how mandatory it is for me and you in our walk with God. So today my goal and my prayer is that God let our people hear. Let them hear what thus saith the Lord God. We can't be pretenders. We can't just be cheerleaders. We have to. We have to be somebody that's just sitting still in hearing the Word of God. As Jay Swallow used to say, we have enough instigators. We don't need no more. We need you to bring something to the table where the Lord's Supper will be prepared. That's the key thing that we need to really identify in this day and time. So I believe it's a great time to be alive here. See, to hear the voice of God, I believe that's the key thing. But he is not the one, we, we already know about that, that we're not the ones that's going to bring in the promise of God, even so Pentecost comes before tabernacles. But God will not establish the promise with Pentecost, but he'll establish it with the tabernacles. In the same way Ishmael was born to Abram, and Isaac was born to Abraham. See, there's some shifting. He's no longer Abram, but now he is he is now Abraham. After God had changed his name in Genesis 17 and 5. So the addition of the Hebrew letter H has a brickly sound. Just like far and fire. They sound a little different, don't they? You got to know how to word your words. So uh, the key thing is going to be he's not Abram, but he is Abraham now. He has, he, in other words, a brand new identity has come upon him. So while he's Abraham, he's going to give birth unto Isaac. So the key thing that we have to understand in this day and time is going to be our whole identity has to shift when we begin to operate and understand the Feast of the Tabernacle. So that's the time that I believe that God wants to shift the church into. That's the time that I believe that we are in. Now, when Abram and Sarah received their new names, it prophesied that the promised seed could come only by the work of the Holy Spirit. So in the case of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit came upon Mary and conceived, him, and conceived him. So in the case of the body of Christ, this is fulfilled corporately. See, we have to understand that. It's fulfilled corporately. It's not something, Bob, that you're going to go in there all by yourself. This has to be done corporately. The same way when they went into the promised land in the old covenant, they all went in together. And what's happening here is as we step in to the promises that God has for this spiritual land, this spiritual Cana that we are here today, that means that there's going to be a corporate people that's going to come into this and have the same mind, same faith, same baptism. They're going to have the same identity of who he is, the one that died on the cross of Calvary. It's that same seed that's inside of them. So that's the time that I believe that we are all operating on. So in the case, the body of Christ, this is fulfilled corporately in the outpouring of the Spirit in the Feast of Tabernacles. 
Pentecost is a feast that is mixed with leaven. This is, this, in other words, it's, it's in Ishmael, a man who had Abram as his father, but Hagar as his mother. I wonder how hard it would be for somebody, if we have all this technology and we're good with it, what the difference, definition between Abram and Abraham. Can somebody find that out in all this technology we have? What is the difference with the name Abram in from Abraham? So this, the prophetic pattern shows us that in the era, in the anointing of Pentecost, the church has faith like Abram, but too often acts like Pharaoh putting others into bondage. That's kind of unique, isn't it? The, how in what the Feast of Pentecost up to now of how humanity knows religion to be like people that are still yet in bondage. They never come out of it. Anybody found it? What's it say? The name Abram is composed of two words, Ahab and Ram. It means something like father is exalted or high father. Okay. Um, and then Abraham on the other hand derives from the words, no, I'm not going to read all that, but um, it, it, and it means because I give you as a father a multitude of nations. See, there's a lot of difference there, isn't it? Abram represents a ram. And what is a ram? When we look at it symbolically, we spiritualize it. What is it? Is a ram like a goat? Male sheep? Hmm. Likes to headbutt, huh? So we're looking at more like a mountain goat, so what it is? Or a mountain sheep or has horns and it likes to bump heads. That kind of does relate to the Pentecost, Pentecostal age, doesn't it? And Abraham represents a, a seed of many nations. So that's the promise that I believe Sarah gave birth unto, which represents the feast of the tabernacles. So we no longer, and what is so unique about this, I want to say this as a leader, when, I, when this ministry first got birthed in, and Sonny, you and Mary Morris, Phyllis, Lemmy, and Sean was just a little old thing at that time, what happened was we always had these rams. We always had, you know, people just, bumping heads at all time from the beginning. From 1980s all the way through uh, 1980s and 90s, the early 2000s. But I can honestly say that this is a time that we have come into that I really am seeing the seed of many nations that's now been birthed in. In other words, I don't see any bumping all that much, unless you guys are bumping heads while I'm not around some words. But the key thing is, I'm, 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 it's not happening in church no more. Amen. It was like uh, me and Dalbert was going to put that cable, we were putting that cable in. And uh, I told him that Wednesday night, you know, we need a, a grill bit, a good cordless grill, everything. Man, I was telling him how to do all of that in the... Uh, and uh, said so we can put a hole in the wall right there by the TV in there. And then uh, I can go in the attic and I can grill another hole where the roof, the old roof is covered up. I'll go in there and pull from the attic and I'll, we'll pull that cable on in there. And Dabbert said, well, we definitely going to need a good grill bit that night on a Wednesday night. But that's all he said. And uh, he showed up. When was he showed up? Friday, Friday morning. And what, I seen him carrying two cane poles. I went, two cane poles. And he had, he had grilled bits, I mean, still in the packets. Took those grilled bits out. 
He said, brother, I believe uh, what we can do is if we grill right here, right here, where this V-shape is, yeah, if we grill right there, we can go underneath everything, that roof and everything. And what I do, I put hooks on these uh, cane poles. He put a hook on there, and he put that cable on it. And he said, I'll stick that through that hole. You get in the attic and hook up to me up there. And it was so simple. <laughs> so simple. But I could have been a ram, and I could have said, now, this is my church, and we're going to do it like this. <laughs> but... But the key thing is, I'm glad Abram is no longer my father, but Abraham is my father now that has that promised seed. David, we're going to go a long ways, dude, if you hang in there. If you hang with me, I'll take you to the other side, okay? <laughs> I appreciate God for each and every one of you here today because I believe he's doing a tremendous work in this day and time. Now, what I really want to talk about is now that we're talking about everything that Pentecost has got and everything, and this is where I'm going to have to stop, and then later on, I don't know when's tonight, I don't know who, who's going to be teaching here, but I, I would like to hear from some of y'all also at the same time. Don't just be instigators or don't just be, you know, but I want you to uh, listen and hear what the revelation is saying, but at the, at the same time, I believe those that will really hear what the Spirit of God is saying, they're finding the will of God and they're finding a brand new path now that they can operate on. And anytime God shows you a new path, you should be able to ask him, God, can I bring and show and reveal that new path that you have given unto me along with all this revelation? See, that's what I want, that's what I want God to do in your life. I want him to reveal something unto you, unto you where we can share and eat from the same table. And what you say, I'm going to take it with me. I'm going to run with it. And you may catch me down in Louisiana somewhere preaching your revelation, but that does not mean, you know, that I didn't hear from God or I'm using your revelation. We're going to be able to eat from the table together and feast with one another and be able to share with one another. I like it when I eat with Bob. When you get around Bob's table, this is, to me, this is new, Okay. They will get, they put the bowl of green beans here. And it gets passed around all around the table. That's new to me, okay? Because I was raised up. Give me this. Hand me that. And whenever we ate, you know, we all had our own self. That, that was just the way I was brought up. Nothing wrong with your hospitality, Bob. I like that. If a, if a bowl of green beans is going to be passed around and here comes the gravy right behind it and mashed potatoes right behind it and the meat is going to come later on if there's any on the table. But anyway, I, I love that pattern there. So no matter how it's done, we all are going to feast together. And I praise God for that. Now, I want to talk now a little bit about from, and this is where I'm going to close out. And I want to talk more, I want to do more teaching on the far of God because this is a time that we're stepping into the far of God is going to burn more than it ever has before. Understand that. In those, uh, I believe, uh, does it take a little far for you to warm up, or does it take a hot far for you to really warm up, naturally? Hot far. Now, the more carnality you are, the harder the far is going to get, okay? The more things that you're hanging on to and the more things that the spirit of the far of God has to burn out, that means God can burn out jealousy and next thing you know, the carnality bursts it back in. But this time it's going to be, in other words, it's a tougher deal because it's now as years and years goes by, that same spirit keeps, you know, it keeps bugging you. It keeps, 
telling you about jealousy, and now it's created, it's built its own uh, walls and everything inside of your mind. So it's going to take a lot of fire to burn that whole building down, okay? But if you're like some people, it just takes a little far, and they will begin to say, this little far will do it. Remember old Huji Fuji Duji, uh, Sonny? Remember him? Man, Huji Fuji Duji, he, he was a man that we used to drink wine with in this area. And we'd, sometimes we'd catch him. He'd be sitting down by the uh, creek, by the river, underneath the bridge. And he'd have just a little old far. I'm just barely. And I can't swat like he used to, but he'd swat. And his old butt would just almost be touching the ground, just be swatting there and just... Staying warm, rolling his Prince Albert and everything. Sometimes you sneak up on him. You say, Hugie! He goes, wah! He's like, come on, humming, come on, humming. I mean, he stood that, that tall. He was ready to duke it out with you now. But anyway, a little far satisfied him. It, it set its purpose. <laughs> you guys are going to get me laughing at But, uh, but I believe <laughs> in the days to come, we're, we're going to see some of, uh, you know, how much far that it's really going to take to burn out what is really. So Revelation 20 and 6, it tells us that the overcomers who take part in the first resurrection will be priests. Now, I got about 20 minutes, okay, or 15 says, blessed, in verse 6, blessed and holy is the one who has a part of the first resurrection over the second death. Let me say this to you very quickly so that I can try to open up a brand new avenue for you. The first resurrection is going to be whenever we begin to see people graduating from the, pe from the Feast of Pentecost and stepping now on in to the Feast of Tabernacles. That's where the first resurrection begins to start working inside of them, okay? So, we, so what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to really grab a hold of this res, uh, revelation and let God really move inside of us. Over the, in other words, over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Now, the book of Hebrews shows us that, the, that this will be a Melchizedek priesthood. And it's not a Levitical one of the old order. However, the pattern foundation of the New Testament are laid in the old, and so we see the concentration of the Levitical priesthood. It's a basic principle that carries over unto the new priesthood. Levit Leviticus 8 is the chapter dealing with the concentration of Aaronic priests of the Levit Levitical order. So Leviticus 8 and 33 is saying, and you shall not go outside the doorway of the tent of the meeting for seven days. Now understand this. You shall not go out of the tent in the meeting. It was more like a concentration. They would have to go inside of this tent for seven days and they would have to have their minds and everything, praying and all of that. And sometimes, whether we know it or not, me and you do the same thing. We try to birth this back in as a Levitical priesthood, but this is not, in other words, what, what we're trying to say here is he's going to, in other words, he will ordain you through seven days. In those seven days, now, Pentecostal up on into the Feast of Tabernacle, you, we, we're finding that in the third day from the crucifixion of Jesus on the cross of Calvary or from Adam up to now, which is seven days, or we can say the seventh heaven is beginning to start up inside of humanity here right now. What we're seeing here is there's a lot of changes. I, I like what, Cro we're live, aren't we? What Carson Smith says, he, he says that uh, 
And then this, he said, hey, hey, c- c- hey. So, I'll say this in Turkey, okay? So they'll have to find an interpreter to, to, to get this, and you can ask me after church. Uh, that's what he said. We're going to re- we're going to reach that place in this feast of Pentecost. Then he said, He said this to me that night. In front, he, I mean, there that cafeteria was packed out. But he was sharing the revelation. And I kind of interrupted him right there. And I said, I I was kind of boosting him up. And I kind of boosted him a little bit. And he said, I mean, he laid some revelation that for me. He said, that can be a place right now inside of your mind, right here in the midst. See, we have to prepare. We have to get ready and let the Holy Spirit do what he hasn't done what he really wants to do. We're, we're just scratching around. We're, we're, we're just now learning about all of this. And we're learning how that in order for this to work, we got to walk together. Yes. Our minds are going to have to be in unity the first thing. It doesn't matter who does it as long as it gets done. Okay? That's going to be the key thing. As long as somebody has the key, let them unlock it so that we can follow here today. Let Jesus be the one. Now, I believe that as we look at this here, In Leviticus, did we eat? Did we eat? (laughs) Did we uh, read read 8 and 33? Leviticus. Now watch this here in Leviticus. And you shall go outside the doorway of the tent of meeting for seven days and until the day that the period of your ordination is fulfilled and he will ordain you through seven days. Now, a lot of people are looking for promotion, but we have now been, what, seven days since the crucifixion of Jesus? This is a time that God is going to ordain and promote people to be what? Over, see, they went inside of a tent for seven days. And me and you are getting ready to go inside of this tabernacle. And when we go inside of this tabernacle, the Feast of Tabernacle, what we're talking about here in this verse, symbolically in the old order, is now they're made to be a priesthood. And me and you are not being made to be an old priesthood but we're made to be a Melchizedek priesthood order. So what happens in this Melchizedek order in the Feast of the Tabernacle, we become priest. So that priest is going to be able to concentrate. So that priest is going to be able, in other words, the Melchizedek order is going to be able to make a sacrifice. Watch this. And what is going to be that sacrifice that he's going to be making here? He's going to sacrifice his own self. He's going to, in other words, 
As he does this in the seventh day, God gives him a green light. Go now. I've made you to be what I've orchestrated in your life. So ha what happens here is in Leviticus 9, 9 chapter, verses 1 through 4, says that it came about on the eighth day. See, this Melchizedek order is going to come into an eighth day. Yes. You with me? Yes. Eighth day that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. And he said to Aaron, Take for yourself a calf, a bull for a sin offering, and a ram for a burnt offering, both without defect, and offer them before the Lord. Then to the sons of Israel you shall speak, saying, Take a male goat for a sin offering, and a calf and a lamb, both one year old, without defect, for a burnt offering, in an ox and a ram for peace offering to sacrifice before the Lord in a grain offering mixed with oil. Now watch this. For today the Lord shall appear to you. Now I'm talking about an eighth day. I'm talking about when the Melchizedek order has been placed. And then they make a sacrifice. Here is a prophetic pattern of the appearing of Christ. This event comes on the eighth day. According to the law of presenting the firstborn to God, like we were reading in Exodus 22 and 30, and how it comes back, Leviticus and 9, we read, and Moses said, this is the things which the Lord has commanded you to do, that the glory of the Lord may appear to you. Now, that's when there's a fire that's going to burn, and this Melchizedek order is going to be able, in other words, that fire is going to be burning inside of them. In order, what, what are, what, in all of these sacrifices, they're going to be making to this whole universe. That's where Revelation 19 begins to come in. How? That now they have a fire that's burning because the wrath of God or the compassion of God is upon them. They have such a compassion upon all the nations and all of the universe here now. And in this wrath, what's happening is that's where all the false prophets and that's where all of these other, uh, other Babylonian systems and everything, what's going to happen is they're going to be cast. Can you imagine that, that whenever people begins to be cast into a fire that fire burns inside inside of me and you here today it's what god has made me and you to be in this day in time just like the same way what jesus was we were all drawn unto him because what was inside of him he had such a love for the whole universe. It's why he died on the cross for each and every one of us. And that same pattern is going to come in or, In other words, when the Melchizedek order is really developed, that's what's going to come forth. They'll be able to make a sacrifice. And what's going to happen in this sacrifice on the eighth day is the Lord is going to appear. And when he appears, the character that... Humanity is, is now just like Christ. And they will begin to follow him. And such a revelation is going to be given unto this universe. That's how come we have such a great big mystery in such a revelation that we need to really take care of. Let it begin to come inside of us. And we need to nourish it. We need to take care of it.
We need to let it be first in our lives because what's going to happen in this sacrifice, the Melchizedek order is going to be consumed first. And out of the ashes is going to come forth a brand new identity. And out of this brand new identity is where there's a Melchizedek order. So they'll be able, in other words, to come against the enemy power with the same fire that they had to go through with. And that far is nothing to torment me and you, but it's to redeem yeah. and burn out carnality and everything, come on, that does not consist of the kingdom of God. Wow. I got to slow, I got to quit, okay? <laughs> but uh, I, I would like to do more teaching on the far in things, but we need to prepare and that's my prayer is, as I pray and dismiss here now at this time, I want to pray that God will prepare you and that God will prepare you that are listening through the live stream. If you're listening, I want you to know that we include you here today. What, whatever God wants to do is what we want to fulfill here. So as, let, let us pray uh, for that because this is a great mission, a great time that it's going to cost me and you everything. That fire that now is getting ready to be burning inside of us, it's going to consume yes. everything. Father, I come before you here this morning. Father, I speak to men and women and everybody that may be listening, Father, on the live stream, thank you for the technology. Father, I pray that your spirit will begin to visit them in a very unique way. Father, I pray here today that all of the enemy power, Father, is defeated. And I pray that one that is listening on live stream for the reason why they're not here, Father, I pray all of what is coming against them. And I pray that you, Heavenly Father, by your Spirit, those issues are going to be laid to the side. Father, that, that there's going to be a door opening for them to step in. Father, and for those that are here with me inside of this building, pray the same thing that the enemy power, Father, within us will now come to a halt. Yes. And we speak to it and say, now let there be room for this revelation and wisdom concerning the eighth day, concerning the Melchizedek order. Father, let it be a time that we step in and you have your right of way inside of each and every one of us. I pray every disease, sicknesses, poverty, whatever that it might be, drug addiction, alcoholism, religious people, Father, whatever hinders, I pray here today that your will will be manifested over this region. Father, I give you praise. I give you thanks for the time that you've allowed us to share this and allowed us to be alive. Now, Heavenly Father, I pray that we will have a father in his name is going to be Abraham. Father, we want that same seed. We know that you are our spiritual father, but we understand where you have placed your promised seed. And who you promised that unto, Heavenly Father. Today, Lord, I just give you praise and I give you thanks in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, Daisy, shut me off.